Welcome to the ITU studio in Geneva. Where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by John Kiff, who is a senior financial expert for the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. John, welcome to the studio. Thanks, Max. Now, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about uh, perhaps you could share your experience at the IMF in the area of digital currency, which is very much what we've been focusing on this week, uh, or central bank digital currency. Yeah, they, I mean, the, the fund is uh, obviously International Monetary Fund. Monetary is a key component of our work. And until recently, that would be focused on conventional money. Um, but um, now, with the, with the world of crypto and cryptocurrencies and so on, um, there's been a growing interest in applying some of that technology um, to central bank um, central banks and their money money making operations. And, and for many, um, they see an opportunity um, to c save money by uh, re reducing the number of paper bills and coinage that they issue and replace it with digital currency. And so many of our member countries, and there's around 180 of those, I lose count, and maybe it's 190, but uh, they, uh, they're coming to us now and saying, we would like to be part of this new revolution. And uh, one of our roles is to give what we call technical assistance um, to countries that are, that, um, and in this case, want to, want to come bursting out of the starting gate and start issuing central bank digital currencies. So why should central banks consider issuing, issuing digital currencies? Uh, and if so, for, for what purpose? I mean, we obviously, uh, say you mentioned, mentioned they're reducing paper, et cetera, but what, what, uh, what are the other advantages that uh, they can hope for? Well, um, we think, in fact, there's m other more important um, dimensions that they should be considering, and, and one of them is financial inclusion. Um, in, in many of the countries that, that we service, um, there, there, there are many people who are unbanked, and sometimes they're unbanked um, because they've got um, um, very concentrated banking systems that aren't, aren't incentivized um, to um, bring in new technology and so on. And everybody these days wants to be in the new mobile, mobile money world and so on, and digital, digital banking. Um, and in other cases, um, we're talking about, say, island, island countries where um, there's just not much of a, a business case for a bank to set up a bricks and mortar branch on these individual items, uh, islands. And uh, so there, there you've got people that aren't, aren't have a, no access to banking services at all. And so um, that I think that's a very compelling case for, for many. And, and some of the advanced countries, um, the, the amount of cash being used is, is falling rapidly. Um, Sweden's the poster child for that, where um, apparently um, you, you can go into some restaurants and they will refuse your cash. And, and in that case, the, the central bank fears that um, money making and money management is, has fallen out of the central bank's hands. It's now being run um, by private uh, actors. China, for instance, just has the similar problem. We've got Alipay and WeChat Pay. You go to China um, and pull out your wallet and try to pay in, in the local currency, forget it. I've, I've been there and I was uh, almost starved, except that someone was at the table who had an Alipay uh, account. Wow, that's, that's great. I mean, I haven't been there for, for a while, but obviously things, things are, are changing quite rapidly. You say a lot of uh, countries are approaching you saying, we, you know, we desperately want to get, get involved. But I think that, I mean, I was asking somebody here yesterday in terms of the rollout time, it's, of course, it's going to vary quite uh, substantially. What are the main issues and challenges that they're going to be facing? The main, the main, well, the main first issue is they've got to realize that this is not just a matter of setting up a computer in the basement that's going to um, spit out um, new digital notes instead of, of physical notes. Um, a, a central bank digital currency operation involves beefing up IT operations um, and cybersecurity. We hear about all these hacks. Well, imagine a hack of the, the that that computer that generates the bank notes. It would be a, it would be the ultimate in counterfeiting because you could you could create billions of dollars or, or whatever currency overnight. So th there's all sorts of infrastructure issues that have to be considered. And in fact. We, I, in my presentations, I often um, show what I call a circle of life for cash, and that usually involves printing money, designing money, um, shipping it out to banks and distributing it, and ultimately destroying it um, when the bills are, are old. And then beside it, I have a circle of life for a digital currency, and it looks an awful lot the same. There's a counterpart to almost everything you do um, on, a, on a cash operation that you have to do in the digital side. And, and, and in a way, the cost, the cost balance is different in cash. It's a lot of physical type. Um, expenses, transportation, printing. It, on the digital side, it's sort of on the other end of the circle, which is the things like the, the IT infrastructure, cybersecurity, and so on. So what's the, what's the, the uh, um, in terms of trust, you mentioned, of course, uh, you know, people 
individuals are going to be qu quite concerned. You know, if you mentioned the, the, the circle of money, paper uh, money, I mean, that's obviously uh, being created and then, dis then eventually having to be destroyed if they haven't, be, haven't been uh, uh, hiding it under the, uh, under the bed, etc. But, uh, but in, in principle, is it digital financial inclusion that's going to be the, the, the biggest incentive or is it, go is, it, is it going to be something else? I think I think I think the most compelling case is for um, the the um, inclusion aspect. Um, even though we know that um, some of the advanced countries are are looking at it, China, um, Canada, and Sweden, and so on. And of course, they're not going to be coming to us for this technical assistance I mentioned. So that may be another reason why I I sort of put them aside. Um, and so the countries that are coming to us are looking at the financial inclusion angle as being the primary one for them. Uh, in one case, for instance, uh, Uruguay, they've done a, an actual pilot, um, and in, and one of their motivations was the um, that the, the population wasn't being served well by the existing banks. And in, in effect, um, the central bank is looking as this a way of giving a little prod to the banks. So it, it actually, the successful implementation of a central bank digital currency there may not be massive um, take up of central bank digital currency. But it could be that the banks will step up to the plate um, and start offering digital services to their, cli their clients. And, and finally, in what areas of digital currency are standards required uh, for central banks? And, and how do you think that the output of the focus group that you, you've been involved with, the digital uh, uh, fiat uh, currency focus group, uh, it could help, or ITU in general, in fact, could help to bridge the standards gap? Well, most of the thinking to this point for us has been about um, what we call retail central bank digital currencies to be used domestically only. They're not intended to be used outside the country. But we look to the next stage where um, other the adjacent countries or trading partners um, are also um, joining the party. Um, and there's also uh, countries that are very tourism oriented. They've got people coming in um, that want to exchange their digital currency for that country's digital currency. So uh, at some degree of uh, interoperability is is required, I think, in the, for that future uh, world. So why not now build towards that future by building standardization into central bank digital currencies, so that when you move up beyond um, the the national domestic only CBDC, that uh, um, you're ready for the interop uh, to interoperate with other countries. And so in that case, that's where um, uh, the work we're doing here at the ITU is really important because we're moving towards that that standardization because other individual central banks aren't terribly motivated um, to, to standardize. They just want get, to get something out the door that suits their needs. But we're the, we're the guys that say, wait a minute, let's, let's do this properly. Let's try to build as much commonality as possible in our products so that some years down the road, um, when we've got these vibrant um, central bank digital currency um, ecosystems in our countries, we're ready to link up with others. Well, John Keep, thank you very much for joining us today in the studio and sharing some very valuable insights. And we hopefully will catch up with you again at some stage in the very near future. Thanks, Max. Thanks a lot.